and I, I got a couple of emails from strangers saying, oh, I finally understand what this thing called ocean acidification is and why it's a problem. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And that moment I realized, damn, I think nobody ever told me thank you before for the research I was doing. <laughs> it, it was a very rewarding experience. Hello everyone and welcome to the podcast that explores the intersection between science, story and play Geekoscopy 101 with me, your host, Dr. Janus Kisten. And today we're exploring animating your science and scientific video abstracts with Dr. Tulio Rossi of Animate Your Science. Welcome to the show, Dr. Rossi. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Janus. It's a tough time for everyone now with things going weird in the world. There's a... Uh different strains of of covid that's hitting and, and worrying everybody but i hope you're doing well on that side uh, i feel way more relaxed now that i'm fully vaccinated because yes the, the, oh, yeah. the variants are a bit scary yeah so tell us a bit about who you are in this moment and what you do yeah well so right now um i have the privilege of helping researchers and institutions from all over the world um, unleash their impacts uh, with, with science communication in the form of uh, videos uh, mostly animated videos or infographics and illustrators illustrations and i help people in two ways uh, i either teach them how to do it uh, with workshops and seminars and online courses or through my team, we do it for them because, you know, most academics are actually quite busy and also asking them to make a shiny animation uh, a bit asking too much uh, sometimes. So some academics prefer to delegate to uh, a professional. And so that, that's what we do. We make animation videos professionally, uh, specifically about science. And so, so to do that, I created a team that is composed by PhD trained science communicators and uh, artists. And by making them work side by side, we can make it happen. Mm. So before you started this, this company, you were uh, in academia studying uh, marine science. How did you get into that? Sure. So my passion for the ocean um, started in the summertime where my family would move to the beautiful island of Elba in Tuscany in Italy, which is the country where I'm from. And over there, you know, I had no brothers or sisters to play with. So I instead went in the ocean and played with the fish or <laughs> some octopus that I would find along the way, snorkeling on a daily basis, spending a lot of time in the water. And I really became passionate about all the little critters and, you know, I would spend hours just turning stones underwater to see what worm or crab would be hiding underneath, things like that. But mm -hmm. then the real, you know, breakthrough happened later on when I was a teenager. I was about 15 and I was doing my scuba diving course. And then I went for my first ever night dive. And that was a transformational experience because I had no idea what to expect. And I went down in the scary, dark, completely pitch black ocean. And all I had was a little torch. And at some point the dive guide gave us a signal, which meant turn off your torch and wave your hands and see what happens. And when I did that, uh, the incredible happened. The water started to glow. It was incredible. It was like being in the middle of the Milky Way with the ability of playing with the stars uh, with your hands. Mm. Uh, it was fantastic. And the best part is that it wasn't magic. It was science. It, it was a well-known biological phenomenon called bioluminescence, mm. uh, where tiny little uh, plankton, uh, some tiny microalgae you cannot even see with your, uh, with your naked eye, would glow as you they feel the water around them is being agitated mm. and it's phenomenal and i was completely blown away uh and i think that really hooked me in and set me on a trajectory to become uh, then a marine biologist mm. that's pretty cool so it's uh when it comes to the ocean like there's just such an inherent wonder to it that i think inspires a lot of people and it's uh yeah it's a fascinating powerful kind of natural force absolutely uh it's a li lifelong fascination i have for the ocean 
So sometime during your time in academia, you realized that there was this need to to communicate, um, you know, academic work in a, in a way that was palatable. But at what, where did you make that? Um, like, where did that point in your life come about? What was that spark? Yeah, so to understand how I got to that point, you need to know that when I was a teenager, last few years of high school, I started playing with graphic design. Uh, my t- art mm-hmm. teacher realized that I like design, so he gave me access to Adobe Photoshop. And I started playing with that, mostly for fun. And then at some point, my best friend, who at the time organized events, asked me, why don't we try to make the flyer for the next party I'm organizing? And I said, well, that's... That's heaps cool. Let's do it. And so I made a first flyer, and then a second one, then a third one. And then eventually I met the guy who was printing those flyers. And he said, hmm, you're pretty decent. Uh, do you want some very poorly paid work? And I said, well, sure. I was 18 at the time, so I didn't have big expectations. And the best was getting free entry in the clubs and free drinks. So that was better mm-hmm. than money at the time. I wouldn't do it now, mm-hmm. but at the time it was a great deal. And so that was really useful because I developed a skill set, which initially I felt would be a plan B if my academic career didn't work out. I could fall back and be a graphic designer. But uh, what happened in reality is heaps better because I really connected the dots. And that happened during the PhD. When, When I had my first paper published, I realized that there was a big problem. Uh, I, you know, did all this work uh, was about the effect of climate change on fish. So I felt like the average uh, person out there should know about it. Uh, but it was, in a way, the story was trapped in this peer-reviewed paper. It was 10 pages long, written in hyper-convoluted way, like all peer-reviewed papers are. And uh, it, it was also behind the paywall. So how am I going to get this story out there? So I tormented myself with this question for some time and then I decided that I wasn't going to try an animated video. But I was not an animator, so all I could do was the more entry-level uh, whiteboard animations. Uh, but you know, that was just enough, you know, uh, I knew graphic design, I figured I could use this entry-level software. And then I learned a lot about how to communicate science using storytelling. It doesn't feel like you're giving a lecture, but feels like you're just telling a story and the person, without even realizing it, absorbs the science uh, in the process. And so I put uh, this first video out there telling the story of my PhD paper and it it worked uh, in a way I could not possibly imagine. And it won prizes in science communication. Thousands of people all around the world all of, a, all of a sudden were learning about my research, uh, which blew me away. And I, I got a couple of emails from strangers saying, oh, I finally understand what this thing called ocean acidification is and why it's a problem. Thank you for doing what you're doing. And that moment I realized, damn, I think nobody ever told me thank you before for the research I was doing. <laughs> It was a very rewarding experience uh, and made me realize that the world is not just made by you know, climate change deniers. Uh, there are actually uh, nice people out there that will show signs of gratitude if we researchers put that little extra effort to make it accessible for everyone. And it really can pay off. So it was a great experience. And then what happened is that I showed it at a conference, at a scientific conference, and all the other, lots of other researchers say, oh, I really like what you did. I wish I could do the same. I just don't know how to do it. Or I don't have the time. So that was the moment when I thought, hmm, maybe I can help these people. Maybe I can do it for them. And at the same time, I was not too keen on pursuing a postdoc. So I decided to take the leap and start a business instead and initially it was just myself but then I started to grow a team got a couple of interns who were designers much better than I was and then little by little I built what today is animate your science uh, and yeah in just since 2017 uh, it's quite amazing to see how far, how far we've come yeah, yeah it's, it's really 
like I said earlier, it's really inspirational when we managed to, to build this, this network. Um, so now that you've started animating your sites and creating um, video abstracts and things like that, do you see kind of this form of, of science communication becoming part of, of mainstream publication? Do you think it should? Do you think it might at some point? Well, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that's the direction where we're going. Uh, the reality is that after decades of publish or perish, uh, we now live in a world where we have more papers than we can read. <laughs> There's two and a half million papers being published every year. That's over 7,000 every single day. And just to give you an idea, during my PhD, I would have had to read more than three papers per day just to keep up with the literature in the field of ocean acidification. And mm. uh, of course, do you think I did that? No, <laughs> and nobody's <laughs> reading all these papers because it's just Difficult impossible. Too. And so yeah. that's the reality of things. So we, we need to figure out how do we stand out from the noise? How do we make sure our research gets noticed? And so I believe that uh, video abstracts and graphical abstracts have, have potential, massive potential to be that tool to achieve multiple goals. First one is to stand out as the individual researcher. So in a way, it's a you know, career-driven goal, but there's also a, a much higher goal, which is to make science truly accessible. Because if you make the video abstract in a way that everyone can understand it, well, then we have really an opportunity to have something that is not protected by a paywall, that is understandable to everyone. And so, I th in my view, this is making science truly open because there's a lot of talking about open science, which is about removing the paywall and making papers free to read. And I think that's great, but it's only a half of the story because then when a non-expert uh, goes and read that paper, it's met by a wall of jargon and mm. cr crazy complicated uh, methodologies that without previous training are impossible to understand. And then the, the experience ends there, right? Or it can end badly, things can get misunderstood uh, and people can be frustrated. So I think the video could really be that little extra that we put on top of the paper that is not just for the expert, that's for everyone. And if we manage to get to that point where these videos will be normal, just like written abstracts are normal today, I think that would be, would be a great service to society as a whole. For sure. I think it, it would also help in, in, I think, the perception of the public um, towards scientists. You know, there's this, sometimes there's this feeling that scientists are just like sitting on our ivory towers, just like passing judgment down to the, to the small people. But it's, that's not really the case. Like scientists are also just people. It's just, like you said, the, the, just the years of, you know, technical, uh, learning and expertise just makes them speak in a different language that that lay people can't speak in so i agree that that video abstracts not only will help with the perception of the science but the scientists as well which i think is really important when it comes to public engagement definitely and also imagine from the fun the funder point of view let's say you're the national science foundation and you're funding research that doesn't even get a citation. That, that's wasted money, yeah. right? <laughs> so there's yeah. also a value for the funding agencies to make sure that what they fund has an impact and is noticed. That's a good point. It's, it's also part of you know closing closing the loop as well of you know taxpayer money that's funding uh, a lot of the science, and sometimes a lot of it doesn't get back to the the taxpayer. It makes you wonder sometimes. Um, whether the money is being used properly or whether we are doing a good service to, to society if we're doing all of this research but nobody knows about it. I think there was a statistic that like 50% of papers are only read by the editors and the authors and the reviewers, like no one else. And that's sad. It's, really it's sad. extremely sad. In a way, it's a massive waste of money and time and effort. Yeah. 
for sure. So we, we can do better, and I think you know the videos will not be the whole solution, but will be definitely part of it. And, and by the way, it's not just me saying this. There's peer-reviewed research that shows that um, read, uh, papers with a video abstract or a graphical abstract attract more citations down the track they get higher uh, impact metrics like alt metrics and, and so on so the, there's also peer review research that confirms that they do the job they're supposed to do so you know for for scientists who are able to have like excess funding even personal funds can come to you and make uh, you know get you to commission the the video abstracts but for the scientists maybe in third world countries that can't afford it what would you what advice would you give them about trying out uh, making graphical video abstracts well this is definitely something researchers can do themselves however it, it does take time and a little bit of effort to learn skill if you don't have it to start and but you know I, will, I usually what I say is this that if you are a student in, you probably have more time and it's a good idea to learn the skill so then you have it for the rest of your life if you are more advanced in your career maybe it makes sense to delegate it because you're too busy mm -hmm. writing grants and going to conferences and all the other things yeah. that a professor needs to do so if you're at the later stage in your career, it makes more sense to delegate it. And in terms of costs, um, it, it depends where you are also in, in the world. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, let's say if you're, let's say in India and you you delegate it to us, you might find it a little bit expensive, but with, maybe within India, there's a similar company that can help you at a much more affordable rate. So it, it's also geographically dependent. For sure. And I'm sure having done like probably hundreds of, of different pieces of science communication, do you have any one piece of, of advice for scientists for communicating their work in general, even if it's not a, a visual uh, representation? Oh, definitely. Uh, I have many uh, tips, but perhaps one of the most important ones is that less is more. <laughs> Let me explain what I mean by that. Um, instinctively, when a researcher, let's say, goes to a conference and presents uh, an oral or poster presentation, uh, the typical mistake is to have way too much on display. You see slides with four graphs, uh, posters with eight, nine graphs, and hundreds of words. And I see why the researchers doing it is because they feel uh, that to be credible, to be, you know, to, to feel confident, they need to show all the data, they've got all the graphs and so on. But it's actually backfiring because the more you show, the less likely it is that the audience will retain anything at all. So if you show four graphs on one slide, you're lucky if they understand one of them. Uh, let's be realistic. <laughs> so there's no point in showing that much uh, content, especially if we're talking about complex things like a graph. You know, it takes some time to digest what it means. Uh, so less is more means cut down, put on your slides, all your on your posters, on your videos, only the very very central things. And I know it's hard to get to that point. It's a process of simmering, boiling it down over and over again until you're left with only the, the very essentials. Uh, but it is necessary because uh, if you do it right, uh, then people will understand and retain that one message you're trying to communicate. If you have too much uh, instead, they will retain nothing and they will forget you. And that's not the outcome you want. And I'll give you that this is a example of how I got to realize what my research was about. And it was a speed networking event where one evening I had to explain what my research was about to 10 different people. And, you know, 
explaining it my way as a marine biologist, you know, why, why, why fish matters, uh, well, a million different things, right? You know, um, and so I was bombarding people with ideas and content and, and so on. But then I, I felt a pattern in what people felt my research was about, and they thought my research was about food. And I'm like, no, 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 my research is not about food, it's fish and the ecosystem and this and that and the settlement habitats and this and that. And then it hit me. I was like, no, fish is just food for people. I am the biased one. <laughs> I was bombarding yeah. them with all these crazy academic ideas. Yeah. yeah. But for the to. average Joe and Jane on the street, fish is just food. But once I realized that, I knew how to frame my story. And for example, mm. in my video, the video I mentioned earlier that really laid the foundations to my career, it was really clear why, what the relevance was, was about food security. But, you know, initially I, I, did, I couldn't get to that conclusion on my own. So for me, it was really important to explain it to others and ask them, so what do you think my research is about? Because uh, unfortunately, when you're doing research on something, you're so bogged down in it, you, you see it way too close and you completely mm. miss the bigger picture. And in my case, the bigger picture was, well, this is about food security. So for you, it might be different, but the, the important thing is to get that external perspective. Well, I ended up giving you two tips instead of one, but you know, <laughs> the second one is bonus. bonus. <laughs> A free bonus. A free yes. bonus. <laughs> It's, that's quite amazing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, I think science communication now is such an interesting topic. There's research going into it. A lot of people are practicing and finding new ways of doing stuff. But yeah, it's like important principles like what you mentioned, like, you know, keeping it simple, like creating a story, finding context, I think is, is, is knowing that basics are very important what do you think on the on the horizon for for psychom or for for video um, animated science do you think there's something interesting coming up in the future well uh, i don't know about anything any new breakthrough i think what, what we'll see is more of the existing trends uh, like the existing trends that are now the early stage really become uh, substantial. For example, the adoption of uh, graphical abstracts, I've really seen that one um, flourish in the last few years. Uh, now there's even many journals that demand a graphical abstract at submission. Uh, I think that it, what will be next, it will be videos. Uh, and by the way, videos don't need to be animated. They can be just like this, you know, talking head of the researcher explaining about what, what they did in their paper, in their research, and it's just fine, you know. So it doesn't have to cost any money, right? You know, they can do mm. people can do it themselves. And I think we'll, in the future, it will, we'll see more and more of that to the point where it will become normal. It might take 10 years until that happens, but I think that's where we're going. And personally, uh, with my company, I think we're working with the early adopters. When we started for you in 2017, we worked with the pioneers, very few mm. that saw value in it. Now it's a much easier uh, proposition to accept, and but still they are the early adopters. I think what we're about to see sure. is, uh, you know, the market really open up when uh, the broader scientific community embraces video as a new way of communicating research. Because that's where the whole world is going. So it doesn't make sense that academia doesn't do it, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. lags behind <laughs> for too long. Oh, yeah, academia yeah. always lags behind with trends, unfortunately, <laughs> but eventually <laughs> needs to catch up, right? <laughs> For sure. Thank you so much for joining uh, Dr. Rossi. You have some very interesting insights. Uh, why don't you tell us where people can find your work and image your science? Sure. So people can head to animate your dot science. Don't add a dot com because uh, we, we don't have that domain. Our domain is dot science. <laughs> so animate science. your dot science. 
and uh, resource we just launched uh, a week ago is our new online course, which is completely for free. And it talks about all these things we discussed today uh, in much more detail with examples you can watch. So you can, for example, get an idea of all the types of video abstracts and graphical abstracts that are available out there. And so to find that one, you need to go to animeyo.science slash visible or vanish. That's the name of the course. Because we're, I, I think that really what we are seeing is academia moving from the old publisher parish to perhaps a new paradigm which we, we could call visible vanish meaning that if your research doesn't stand out in some way it's like it never happened unfortunately because there's so much of it out there they would you know even if there's nothing wrong with your research it would, if the risk is, is real they will just get lost in, in, the, in the noise so although i don't want this to happen to you and so let's make our research visible so we don't vanish Sure, that sounds like an interesting concept. I'll post the links down in the description. Otherwise, thanks for joining Dr. Rossi. And uh, yeah, I'll have, I'll have you again, I think, in a few years when we see whether things change with academia. We'll see how long it takes. It, it will be <laughs> an interesting so conversation much. in a few years. <laughs> Thank you, Yanis, for having sure. me. That was a lot of fun. Sure, thanks. Cheers. Cheers.